Charon talks about suicide a lot, um, and he looks at it sort of calmly and dispassionately, even though it's an issue that I don't think we can really divorce uh, from our emotions, from our passions. He speaks about it polemically or emotionally in other places, but you know, in some places he's quite clinical, or at least matter of fact, I guess, not so much clinical. Uh, he's got a thing in um, brief, uh, short history of decay of, called Resources of Self-Destruction. Uh, quote, what gift is more mysterious than being able to do what we will with ourselves and refuse to do it? In other words, you know, um, consolation by a possible suicide widens into infinite space this realm where we are suffocating. Suffocating, or he says we are suffocating, but I would say if we are suffocating. The notion of destroying ourselves, the multiplicity of means for doing so, their ease and their proximity delight us and fill us with dread. For there is nothing simpler and more terrible than the action by which we decide irrevocably upon ourselves. In a single second, we do away with all seconds. God himself could not do as much. And there's a thought, eh? But, braggart demons, we postpone our end. How could we renounce the display of our freedom, the show of our pride? So, uh, an eject button or um, lever that, you know, you're fighter plane has just been hit by a missile and you eject. Um, I'm out of here. Boom. <laughs> um, or, you know, it's um, I can leave this whenever I feel like it. So what possible um, what possible hold can life have on me, even the horrors of existence? I, you can always check out. Um, I agree with that point of view. Um, <clears throat> I think that it's a very useful thing to bear in mind when we think that we've reached the ed end of our rope. There is a downside to this, though, um, which um, Herman Hesse, I mentioned actually yesterday, the Steppenwolf, it's interesting how he uh, calls the Steppenwolf, this, the archetypical Steppenwolf, the truest suicide, in that it's not that such a person um, commits suicide, although I one would assume that maybe they are actually more prone to suicide. I don't know if, if you've read the book about Steppenwolf. It's about a person just trying to reconcile the many different facets of his character at the age of 50. Um, but he says that, that that kind of a person is the truest suicide because it's essentially the slightest shock evokes um, feelings immediately of suicide. Um, you have a minor alter altercation in the street with somebody who bumps into you. It becomes such so traumatic to you that you feel like killing yourself. You're nowhere, not even remotely close to doing that, uh, to actually killing yourself. But bang, automatically you start thinking of suicide. Um, I can't handle this. I gotta pull the eject button right away. You don't do it, but you're constantly dogged by these thoughts. Um, when I was in my advanced depression 25 plus years ago, that's how I felt. Um, just little things would evoke suicidal ideation, um, where you would just say, all right, this is this minor issue. I can't handle the repercussions, uh, especially if you're sort of a walking raw nerve, which a lot of people in deep depression are, everything, every last thing causes you agony. Um, so you, you're constantly sort of pestered by the thought of suicide, as opposed to you always have it at your beck and call. What relationship are you to the suicidal ideal or the suicidal ideation? Choran, in this passage I quoted, shows that suicide can be one of your most useful and beneficent um, crutches, maybe not, and that's kind of got a pejorative now, but tools to cope with life. Whatever happens, you can undo it like that, permanently, no more trouble. Um, 
that's a nice way to see it and I think that it's actually a healthy way what about if this if suicide is actually something behind you dogging you and whispering its devilment in your ear unbidden and in a completely uncoordinated fashion you see what you know when I refer to what is my relationship to my tools right um, I said I've maintained all along that logic is a tool but if we start discovering formulas that say that we, sh we, we in, in some sense should not be what we are then I, I think it's fair to say that our tool has not it's outgrown its toolness it's become something of a master or uh, a god even um, suicide as a tool is a very good thing if you ask me because it gets you through many tough times if you understand it for what it is and if you are in control of your relationship to it but again in Hess's version of suicide it's in control of you <laughs> um, you're walking around with this devil always whispering in your ear um, where you're trying to sort of deal with the world and your suicidal ideation is an obstacle to that as opposed to a tool um, a useful um, ingredient of any strategy of coping with the universe um, there's em elements of that in um, you know omnia transient uh, death itself it's you know the non-suicidal death <laughs> Just that it's just coming. <laughs> um, you know, death can be your friend because it's the great completer. It's the great resolver, I guess, is what I would put it. Um, uh, it's um, the metaphor of Shiva as the completer or as the destroyer comes to mind. Um, that which is must be in s at some point not. Um, uh, whatever comes into existence inevitably decays and dies or is demolished or is destroyed one way or another if you can make your peace with that fact and even actually love that fact about the universe which I mentioned in my discussion about Lord of the Rings and mortality versus immortality which is preferable um, you know you can just sort of say alright yeah the death and suicide um, death being involuntary and suicide being voluntary more or less suicide although it's kind of blurry isn't it eh? when you think about it what's voluntary suicide you know <laughs> think about that for a while um, but the distinction between um, what would you call it useful and toxic suicidal ideation uh, I think is something that has to be pointed out um, Charan is saying, look, my ideas, and, and Mystic of, his, of the Sands and other people who have actually delved into it can read it and say, look, all he's saying is um, the, the, before the god of suicide, every problem on earth must bow its head. It has, it has no power over that. You could say the same thing as death, about death. Um, the Eastern view of the nature of death is nowhere near as negative as ours is, although, of course, you know, their view of life is a bit more, <laughs> quite a bit more negative than ours. It's almost as though they fear life more than they fear death. Um, but, again, um, death as resolver, as the great resolution of everything, is nice, but death as great poisoner of everything you are or the great crippler in the case of, as I say, the, the Steppenwolf type suicidal t tendencies or suicidal ideation is not a help. I would say it's, it's an, an active hindrance. Being constantly dogged by suicidal thoughts that you don't want to have that, that spring at you. Again, um, my view is attempt to control your own experiences because everything seems to have a dual nature as I say I'm now talking about death and suicide which has a double nature uh, multifaceted nature I would say probably infinite number of facets uh, but here we're talking about the two 
Is death good or bad? Is suicide good or bad? Is suicidal ide ideation good or bad? It can be both. It's the experience of these things that makes the difference. And if you're talking at the level of the experiential, you can actually agree with everything that Choran says about this and not be affected by your very agreement. Because he, are you talking about the experiential or are you talking about the phenomenal? Are you talking about what's happening outside of yourself or are you talking about what's happening inside of yourself? Because the two are not the same thing. I can agree with everything that somebody says. I can agree with the most negative, pessimistic, or whatever you know person I want. But does that agreement have to translate into um, a toxic or fundamentally uh, sympathetic uh, experience? In other words, if I agree that um, I don't know something very obvious that I don't know that getting penned up in a concentration camp, starved and gassed, is a bad thing, I can at least imagine so manipulating one's experiences that its badness at least has a lot of its edges filed off. I haven't read much Holocaust literature, but I know that, you know, say, Viktor Frankl sort of said that he found, essentially, he found meaning as a result of the Holocaust, as a result of the fact that he was swept up in it. Um, you know that's that, that's kind of crazy, but again, you're sort of you're you're questioning the most basic assumptions and axioms. Um, I don't think Frankel, as a observant Jewish person, thought that the Holocaust was a good thing. Uh, but I think that he would say that experientially we can learn from that. I know that that's crazy, but again, the will to meaning comes from there comes from his experiences in there. But does that mean that he wants to bring the Holocaust back? No, of course not. But you can, at the experiential level, take benefit from something that you fundamentally oppose. Um, I'm not a person who advocates suicide, but I'm not opposed to it all that much. But I think that in some fundamental sense, a while back, in a formative period of my life, I decided to live life until I died of natural causes, or until I died involuntarily, I'll put it that way. So I've set aside the idea of suicide. Um, I've decided that that's not the way I'm going to live. Or, <laughs> how do you say that? That's not... I'm not going to commit suicide, I'll put it that way. Um, but does that mean that I have to then say that suicide is, in all cases, a bad thing. That's the mistake a lot of people make, I think, when they adopt a certain point of view. They allow it to fanaticize them, um, to say that suicide is wholly bad and that there's nothing good in it, or life is wholly bad, or whatever is wholly bad. Um, a couple of years ago, I was known to say that depression was wholly bad. There was nothing good in it whatsoever. And a few years after that, I was starting to say, look, on the continuum, on the broad canvas that is my life, that hellish worst thing in the world, that my own version of Room 101 or Auschwitz, seems to have improved my life as a whole. What doesn't kill me makes me stronger, I guess. Um, but there's there's more to it than that. Um, you are sorely tried by these things, but you develop strengths and you develop tools that you can apply to the rest of your life as a result of adversity. So, yeah, I think that I can say that I, I go along with, or I do not oppose and I understand and accept Choran's view of suicide and a lot of people's view of suicide but I would say that it's also in, an, in itself it's also a one-sided view his view of it is one-sided um, to some people suicidal ideation is not a nice thing it is not a very nice thing at all it's something that's coming at you that you have not 
learned to embrace. I guess that's just what Sharon is saying. Try to learn to embrace it. I don't know. At least the ideation of it, or maybe even the act. Who knows? Uh, but that's easier said than done. And I would say that if you're going to approach suicide that way, I don't think you can use this kind of approach. Because somebody who wants to use suicide as a tool, or who wants to keep it as a tool in their toolbox as a way of coping with life, is not... If they've, already, if they've already got too much of the ideation in their life, it's time to cut back on it a bit and step back from it. Um, Charon doesn't help you do that. Um, I, well, I suppose one could say that he, in, you know, if you really want to read him incredibly sympathetically, yes, he, maybe he does. But I would say it's hard to make that case when you consider all the other ways that one could talk about the subject of suicide. Um, it has a multifaceted nature. For the purposes of this, this discussion, I would say it has a dual nature. And his ideas on suicide speak to a certain type of suicidalness. <laughs> um, but they don't speak to the other ones. And to the other ones, his point of view, I would say, is toxic.